Hey everyone, welcome back to another video here on Try Hack Me. Today we're going to be taking a look at the room, what is networking? Begin learning the fundamentals of computer networking in this bite-sized and interactive module. This is a really cool module. This is, uh, I believe, had some new technology uh, introduced into it by our developers. Uh, very excited to go through this, and it should be a nice one. Let's go ahead and dive into task one, what is networking? Networks are simply things connected. For example, your friendship circle. You are all connected because of similar interests, hobbies, skills, and uh, different sorts of things. Uh, and this is sort of where the term networking comes from. Uh, if you are doing job hunting or other things like that, as you know someone who knows someone, things like that. Networks can be found in all walks of life. A city's public transportation system, the London Tube is a great example of this because it is a very well in interconnected network. Uh, and it's a very big one too. Infrastructure such as the National Power Grid for electricity, another very important network. Meeting and greeting your neighbors, again, sign a, more of a safety network in that case. The postal system for sending letters and parcels, and so on and so forth. You can see networks everywhere in your life, and they're very, very important concepts. But more specifically, in computing, networking is the same idea, just dispersed to technological devices. Take your phone as an example. The reason that you have it is to access things because if it didn't do anything it'd be kind of like an old uh, I don't know an old Palm Pilot or an old PDA where you know it's not that much good it can it may be a calculator uh, disputing the claim that your teacher would say that uh, you wouldn't have a calculator carried around in your pocket all the time but it, you can see the importance of networks we'll cover how these devices communicate with each other and the rules that follow in computing a network can be formed by anywhere from two devices to billions so it doesn't really matter as long as it's more than or two or more these devices include everything from your laptop and phone to security cameras traffic lights and even farming networks are integrated into our everyday life be it gathering data for the weather delivering electricity to homes or even determining who has the right way at a road right of way rather because networks are so embedded in the modern day, networking is an essential concept to grasp in cybersecurity. Take the diagram below as an example. Alice, Bob, and Jim have formed their, no or their own network. We'll come onto this a bit later. Or we'll talk about this a little bit later on, so you can see just a basic network. Networks come in all shapes and sizes, which is something that we'll also come on to discuss throughout this module. Let's go ahead and dive into the question. What is the key term for devices that are, are connected together? That is a network. And there we go. We'll go ahead and close that. And let's go ahead and go into task two. What is the internet? Now that we've learned what a network is and how one is defined in computing, just devices that are connected, let's explore the internet. The internet is one gigantic network that consists of many, many small networks within itself. Using our example from the previous task, let's now imagine that Alice made some new friends named Zane and Toby that she wants to introduce to Bob and Jim. This is starting to sound like an office reference. The problem is that Alice is the only person who speaks the same language as Zane and Toby, so Alice will have to be the messenger. And you can see that Alice is here in the middle where she's the messenger for these two. Because Alice can speak both languages, they can communicate to one another through Alice forming a new network. The first iteration of the internet was within the ARPANET project in the late 1960s. This project was funded by the United States Department of Defense or Defense Department and was the first documented network in action. However, it wasn't until 1909 when the internet as we know it was invented by Tom or Tim Berners-Lee by the creation of the World Wide Web or otherwise shortened to WWW. It wasn't until this point that the internet was used as a repository for storing and sharing information, like it is today. Let's relate Alice's network of friends to computing devices. The internet looks like a much larger version of this diagram, and you can see this is a very abbreviated, intensely abbreviated version of the internet, where we have many small networks that are interconnected with a translating device in the form of a router. Even though this is not necessarily translating, it's NAT and PAT, don't worry about that right now. Just know that this is just a way that we have gateways for our private networks to talk to the internet. As previously stated, the internet is made up of many small networks all joined together. 
These small networks are called private networks. Uh, so think your home network, a business network, things like that. Where networks connecting these small networks are called public networks. Try saying that 10 times fast. Or the internet. So to recap, a network can be one of two types. A private network or a public network. Devices will use a set of labels to identify themselves on a network, which we will come onto in the task below. So who invented the World Wide Web? That will be Tim, I'm gonna have to grab his name from up here, as I can't spell it. Tim Berners-Lee, and we can just copy that. And there we go. If I don't leave the other part of the answer on there. All right, perfect. Let's move into task three, identifying devices on a network. To communicate and maintain order, devices must be both identifying and identifiable on a network. What use is it if you don't know whom you're talking to at the end of the day? You know, if you're just yelling into the void and the void starts talking back, that's a little strange. Devices on a network are very similar to humans in the fact that we have two ways of being identified via our name and our fingerprints, among a couple other things, but those are good generalizations. Now we ha can change our name through deed uh, poll, but however, uh, we can't change our fingerprints. So we can change our name, we can't change our fingerprints. That's the general gist of this. Every human has a, an identical set or individual set of fingerprints, which means that even if they change their name, there is still an identity behind it. The general idea behind this is that, yes, you can change the what you're called, uh, and that's something that, you know, you might have a nickname or other things like that, but you're always going to have some permanently identifiable marks. Um, and computers have the same thing. Devices have the same thing. They have an IP address, which can change, but they have a uh, what's in theory a globally unique MAC address or a media access control address. You can see that right there. Think of it, it's kind of similar to a serial number, but these are all standardized. Uh, and it's split up in a couple of different ways where the first half is the manufacturer and the second part is the unique part. I won't go too far into this, but just know that while you can be called different things, your MAC address is generally, in theory, globally uh, unique. IP addresses. Briefly, an IP address, or Internet Protocol address, can be used as a way of identifying a host on a network for a period of time, where that IP address can then be associated with another device without the IP address changing. First, let's split up precisely what an IP address is in the diagram below. So before we go into this, think of this as your street address. Other people can live there. You probably aren't the only person that's lived at that address, and you might not be the only person you know using that computer at that address. Uh, and this can change hands, and it might change over time with you know people changing the way that the address system is set up for streets, things like that. But this is how we know how to send mail to you. And the same thing goes for computers. An IP address is a set of numbers that are divided into four octets, and you can see one here, one here, one here, and then one here. And you can see that these have a range of 0 to 255. Uh, this is because they are made up of eight binary bits, if I remember correctly, and uh, they the range for that is 0 with all of the bits being turned off. And then if you turn them on ones or everything is on, your limit is 255. The value of each octet will uh, summarize to be the IP address of the device on the network. So all of these put together, the individual octets can mean things, but generally speaking, don't worry about that right now. This is your street address on the network. It's how your computer knows to talk to someone else. So this might be your router's address on your home network. Uh, this uh, actual network uh, itself is pretty common for home networks. So 192.168.1.0 and this last bit would be what changes, or sometimes this is a zero, but these first two, pretty common for home networks. And that's where you have the first and second octet, or octets that are static. I won't go too far into that, but just know that this might be a router address. It's very common for that. Uh, what's important to understand here is that the IP addresses can change from device to device, but they cannot be active simultaneously more than once. So if you have a street address, your neighbor can't have the same one. You can swap houses with your neighbor and that'd be a little weird, but you could, you will have a different address living at that house. You can't have uh, that collision because that causes problems and both of the devices will say, hold on, we need to figure something out here. IP addresses follow a set of standards known as protocols. These protocols are the backbone of networking and force many devices to communicate in the same language, which is something that we'll come on to another time.
However, we should recall that devices can be on both a private and public network. Depending on where they, uh, where they are will determine the type of IP address they have, a public or private IP address. Uh, so real quick, there was a note in here, um, protocols. So the reason that we have that and the reason that we all use the same language, uh, metaphorically speaking, to talk to each other over the internet is because when the internet first came out, we had a bunch of different protocols and sort of like trying to talk to a bunch of different people that don't speak the same language doesn't really work out. You can kind of get the general gist, but you know, the, the communication just doesn't happen. So we established these protocols, um, and they were something that were much more uh, solidified with the creation of Wi-Fi. Uh, definitely something that if you're interested in learning a little bit more, the Wikipedia page has a great summary of why this is important. Um, but generally speaking, we have to have rules. Otherwise, uh, a lot of device manufacturers like Microsoft and HP, IBM, you go on, name whatever one you want, they'll just make their own and claim it's the fastest. And the other devices won't work with it because they want you to buy their device. So just keep that in mind. Uh, that is why we have protocols that force everyone to use the same standardized uh, communication. A public address is used to identify the device on the internet, whereas a private address is used to identify a device amongst other devices. I uh, Think of this home network versus anyone can talk to it on the internet, generally speaking. Take the table uh, and screenshot below as an example. Here we have two devices on a private network, and we can see the private ranges right here. There are three private ranges predominantly, uh, 192168, and these last two bits can change, or last two octets rather can change, is a major one. Uh, the 10 uh, 000, 000 is another big one, and there's another one that I can never remember the full of it uh, because it has a range in the second octet. Um, I recommend taking a look at these and we might go over them later in the room, but just know that there are three very distinct uh, ranges that the private IP ones can fall into. And these would be public because they don't fall into that range. And we can see them labeled over here on the side. Uh, these will be on the same network because these are, well, okay, in theory, they could be on the same network. They might not necessarily, but they're very likely to be uh, because we have 192, 168, 1, and then 74, and then 77. These could exist on the same network because they don't conflict, um, and they could talk to each other in theory if there's not routing rules or other restrictions in play. Uh, and here you can see this would, might be a screenshot from a router that we have these two devices with their MAC addresses. Um, don't worry too much about this right now. Just know that this is in theory unique, uh, and these are the private IP addresses that uh, they have on the network. And they were assigned via DHCP, which just means that I have a pool of addresses, first come, first serve, and we give them out. Uh, and they're not necessarily like, you get this one permanently on this network. That would be a static addressing. These two devices will be able to use their private IP addresses to communicate with each other. However, any data sent to the internet from either of these devices will be identified by the same public IP address. So your home would have a public IP address in this case, but you'll have your private IP, uh, your private network sits behind that. Public IP addresses are given by your internet service provider or ISP for short uh, at your monthly bill. So when you buy, when you have an internet service contract set up, you'll have a, an IP address that is associated with your home. Uh, sometimes this can be associated with a couple of different homes. Uh, this can get a little weird. Um, you can pay to have this not change and be static, but just know that this is something that exists on the public internet in this case. As more and more devices become connected, it is becoming increasingly harder to get a public address that isn't already in use. Uh, for example, Cisco, an industry giant in the world of networking, estimated that there will be approximately 50 billion devices connected on the internet by the end of the uh, 2021, so the current year in the time of this recording. Enter IP address, uh, or address versions. So far, we've only discussed one version of the internet protocol addressing scheme known as IPv4. IPv4 is pretty old. Um, it had some limitations that we didn't really anticipate this many devices to be connected to the internet, uh, but we have smart homes and other things like that, which dramatically increases uh, the number of devices that we're connecting to the internet on the whole, uh, especially if they need public addresses. Uh, and this uses a numbering system uh, of two raised to the 32nd IP addresses, so 4.92 or 29 billion. Uh, so you can see why there's a shortage because we have more devices that are connected to the public internet uh, than we have available for IPv4 addresses. IPv6 is a, well, relatively new iteration 
of the Internet Protocol Addressing Scheme to help tackle this issue. Although it is seemingly more daunting, it boasts a few benefits. So it supports up to 2 to the 128th uh, power of IP addresses, so this is 340 trillion plus. Uh, in theory, we should ever run out of these. We'll see what happens, uh, just because more devices are being connected. Um, and it resolves that big issue with IPv4, because we were going to run out. Now we really can't. More efficient due to more or new methodology. So there's a bunch of new technologies that were introduced in this. Don't worry too much about knowing this. Just know that in general, IPv6 has a bunch of cool, new, shiny features. Uh, and you can see there's a comparison of those two addresses. So with an IPv4, we had these four octets. And this is a lot longer. I won't go too much in the detail. Just know that IPv6 exists. This is not as common to see on home networks. Uh, generally speaking, you need to know about this, just that it exists. And once you get further into penetration testing or defense, knowing that IPv6 is another way that things can talk to each other, that's just another thing to be aware of. So that's all you need to know at this point in time. Just focus on IPv6. And this is going to be where most everybody focuses nowadays. Anyhow, let's go ahead and talk about MAC addresses. Devices on a network will all have a physical network interface, which is a microchip board found on the device's motherboard. This is your Ethernet port uh, or your Wi-Fi card, whatever this is. This network interface is assigned a unique address at the factory it was built at called a MAC address, a media access control address. Uh, this is referred to as burnt in, uh, in quotation marks. Uh, this is because in theory it can't be changed. You can do spoofing and other things with this. Don't worry about that too much right now. Just know, again, this is in theory globally unique. And the odds that you're going to have two devices on the same network that have the same Mac, very, 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 very infinitesimally small chance. Uh, big businesses can run into this every once in a while, but it's pretty rare. The MAC address is a 16 character hexadecimal number, a base 16 numbering system used in computing to represent numbers. You can see that this is hex uh, base 16, where it rolls over from nine and it starts A, B, C, D, E, and then F is the last one. Um, and you can see that this is an example of a MAC address here where it is six groups of two of these. The first six characters represent the company that made it. So right here, uh, that made the networking interface and the last six is in theory a unique number. So, and you can see that broken apart down here. However, an interesting thing with MAC addresses is that they can be faked or spoofed, as I mentioned before. Uh, this spoofing occurs when a network device pretends to identify as another by using its MAC address. Uh, when this happens, it can often break poorly implemented security designs that assume devices talking on a network are trustworthy because they're not. Uh, don't worry too much about this. This is more of a situation of just know about this. It's not something too major, uh, and you'll come across it later on in your security career. Take the following example. A firewall is configured to allow any communication going to and from the MAC address of the administrator. If the device were to pretend or spoof this MAC address, this firewall would uh, now think that it is receiving communication from the administrator when it is not. So places such as cafes, uh, coffee shops, and hotels alike often use MAC address control when using their guest or public Wi-Fi. This configuration could offer better services, i.e. a faster connection for a price if you're willing to pay the fee per device. Uh, the interactive lab attached to this task has been made to replicate this scenario. And let's go ahead and spin that up right now. So in theory, you could just pretend to be someone else. That is something that happens. Let's go ahead and scroll back down to the practical bit. The interactive labs simulate a hotel Wi-Fi network. You have to pay for the service. You'll notice that the router is not allowing Bob's traffic, Bob being right down here, but Alice's package green right here are going through just fine because she paid for the Wi-Fi. Try changing Bob's MAC address to the same as Alice's and see what happens. And let's see, I think I need to scroll down and Let's try changing these to be the same. If I can type this all out. Let's see if I can just highlight this. Copy. Oh, I can. And there we go. And now suddenly we can talk out to the internet. And we got a flag. Uh, don't worry too much if you can't read that. I'm going to go ahead and paste that here. Uh, da, da, da. So THM, you got on Try Hack Me. So in theory, you could spoof your MAC address if you haven't paid for Wi-Fi like this. 
Uh, just something to know about. Again, just know the idea that MAC address control exists and that MAC addresses are in theory globally unique. That's really all you need to get from this. Let's go ahead and go into the other questions. What does the term IP stand for? That is going to be Internet Protocol. What is each section of an IP address called? That is going to be an octet. How many sections in digits does an IP address have? That will be four. And let's see, what does the term MAC stand for? Media Address Control, I believe. Uh, it should be Access Control, I'm guessing. There we go. Perfect. Let's go to move into task four, ping with ICMP. Let's go ahead and pull this up so we don't have to watch packets fly across. Ping is one of the most fundamental network tools available to us. Ping uses ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, packets to determine the performance of a connection between devices. For example, if the connection exists or is reliable. So this is a way that we can determine performance. The time taken for ICMP packets traveling between devices is measured by ping, as, such as in the screenshot below, and we can see the output of a ping command here. This measuring is done using ICMP's echo packet, and then ICMP's echo reply from the target device. And you can see that we have a ping command with our target up here, and then we have our time here, and then it looks like we have our average back here. So the average performance, or how much time it takes us to talk to another device. Pings can be performed against devices on a network, such as your home network or research resources such as websites. This tool can be easily used and comes installed on operating systems, OSs, such as Linux and Windows. The syntax to do a simple ping is ping and then the IP address right here or your website URL. So ping is the command and then either the website URL or the IP address. And you can see that demonstrated down here. Here we are pinging a device that has the private address of 192.168.1.254. Ping informs us that we have sent six ICMP packets, all of which were received with an average time of 5.3 seconds. Now that we, now you are going to do the same thing to ping the IP address of 8888. This is one of Google's DNS servers on the deployable website in this task. Pinging the correct address will reveal a flag and answer the following questions. Let's see. So let's go ahead and dive into the questions. What protocol does ping use? ICMP, if I can type. What is the syntax to ping uh, all tens? That will be 10 or ping 10, 10, 10, 10. And what flag do you get when you ping quad eights? Uh, let's see, I guess we just put it up here. And then we'll go ahead and send our ping requests. I'll give it just a moment to finish its ping. And there we have our flag. I pinged the server. Let's go ahead and copy that out and we'll paste it in. And let's move into task five. Continue your learning intro to LAN. Continue your learning by joining the intro to LAN room. Uh, we'll go ahead and mark that as complete. And otherwise I will see you in the video for that room. Uh, but until then, as always, I have the Try Hack Me Discord as well as the separate link in the video description below. If you have any questions, feel free to hop in there. But until next time, happy hacking.